Hi everyone and welcome to my video on delving deeper into the curriculum guidances. Making content is hard. This is the seventh time I have recorded this video and to be really clear I think the reason I'm struggling so much to record these videos is because one, I forget to close my curtain on my skylight, <laughs> but two and most importantly these are really complex things to try and compare and actually it's not so straightforward to explain that one is better than the other. They are actually they're both very good guidances, they're both top notch, you know, we, we're very lucky to have both to choose from. And every time I look through the video, I forget about something that I should have covered. So I'm going to be a little bit different in this video. I don't normally use very strict headings and questions to sort of, um, sort of guide my conversation, but it's the only way that I can think of to make this video flow a little bit better. So please do bear with me. I know it's a little bit different. If you're not really sure what I'm on about, if you're not really aware of the new curriculum guidances and you're not sure about the difference between statutory and non-statutory, please do check out my first video. It's on Instagram TV. It's also on YouTube read it, sorry, listen to it, um, ingest it, understand it as best you can, comment if you've got any questions and then come back to this video. I don't want to recover that content because it's going to be a long video anyway and we just don't really need to hear all the information again. So I'm going to start off talking briefly about what my first impressions were of these guidances, then I will get into the comparison between the two and I'll talk a little bit at the end about what people think about it and also what my personal opinions are. Yes, I'm suddenly wearing a jumper and in a moment the jumper will be gone again and that's because when you're making a video and you make a mistake, finding the same clothes to wear again is almost impossible. So um, let's think a little bit about first impressions of the, these two distinct guidances. So I'm going to start first of all with Birth to Five Matters. So Birth to Five Matters is a rather chunky document. Look at the size of it. There are over 73,000 words. I did not hand count these. I asked my computer to do it, obviously. But 73,000 words is a lot when you compare it to 23,000 in the other guidance. Now, word count doesn't mean everything. It's really about the content at the end of the day. So if we're thinking specifically about content, well, the first 50 pages of this guidance are what I would call the preamble. So the, the stuff that comes before the actual sort of meat and I'm sorry to the vegans, but I'm a vegan, um, to the meat of the um, actual guidance, which is the, the principles of EYFS, you know, the unique child, the enabling environments, the positive relationships. So the preamble to that is this bit here, the 50 pages of very, very useful information, but potentially this could have been a different guide. This could have been a separate document or even a training course or free guidance available separately, rather than being part of this document because whilst the principles that are discussed within this first 50 pages are part of and interwoven with the rest of the information, the actual principles, those you know, enabling child unique environment and positive relationships, whilst it's interwoven, you don't really need to have that information available straight, you know, in the same document. I think you read it once and then you assimilate it and it's just part of your thinking. Um, maybe that's just me, but I, I, I've never really seen anybody use um, sort of the preamble in the documents to any great effect um, on a day-to-day -day basis. I think it's really just about making sure people know it at some point. So that was my first impression about that, meaty. I do like the design, I have to say. Thank you to the designer who created a colourful front cover. Um, the DFE are apparently allergic to colour. Um, um, the document itself it is taken on the same format of the Development Matters 2012, which is interesting in the use of the different principles of the EYFS. Here at the top, you've got unique child, positive relationships and enabling environments. So it's, it's interesting that it's stuck with a familiar format for us to use. So it's not such a big change. Um, I like the fact that they've got pictures on there as well. And if I'm honest, it just feels a little bit like a friendly guidance to pick up and use. So actually, first impressions are very positive about it. I dislike the fact that they've chosen to use ranges, but I will cover that later on when I go a little bit deeper into the comparison of the two documents. And then first impressions of the Development Matters document. Like I said before, goodness me, DFE, hire yourself a new designer. Do you really need to have a document that is this bland to go with all of the other bland documents that you have available? Um, 
I would not be able to pick this out amongst a group of documents on a table. In fact, I have a full shelf of documents from the DFE, and unfortunately this one's going to have to go on a different coloured binder, just so I can pick it up easily. It's, I find that frustrating, but hey, that's just me. I don't know if you'll, you'll be the same. Obviously, they've chosen the portrait format as well, which is different to the Development Matters 2012 version. And again, that might not bother everybody, but for me personally, I just don't really like it as much in terms of a working document. Um, that being said, they have really slimmed down this document, 23,000 words. They've really slimmed down the amount of information in it to make it much more digestible for people. And they've chosen to use very slim, I don't mean slim, what do I really mean? They've used fewer stages, but those stages themselves are much broader. They've chosen to use birth to three, three and four year olds and um, reception age children, which in itself can cause a bit, of a, a bit of an issue and I'll cover that later on. But I appreciate the fact that it's been slimmed down to some extent rather than having huge amounts of information for each of the strands within the EYFS. Okay, so the good parts of birth to five matters. I've covered some of my first thoughts about this. When you get a little bit nitty gritty, actually there's some really, really good aspects of this. And I think it really depends on what your original thoughts are about the Development Matters 2012, but also what your thoughts were about the need for change. So I personally felt it was a necessity to update the guidance that we were using because many people were becoming quite tired of it. They weren't using it effectively. And there were some aspects like the technology strand and to some extent the reading and writing that I didn't feel feel matched up to what was actually happening in schools and settings. Um, so I did appreciate the fact that we needed to change. It might be different, I don't know. But the Birth to Five Matters, they've taken the 2012 Development Matters as a starting point for their guidance. Now, in a good way, that's brilliant. You've got some really effective uh, practice within that guidance. You've got some great content. And I also like the fact that we've got unique child enabling environments and positive relationships. And I suppose it's quite a an optimistic ideal here, but really we all should be using those positive relationships and enabling environments. We don't, but we should be. And it's nice that we have that stuff available. So if you've got a team around you who are perhaps a little bit less experienced or yourself, maybe you, you're a bit concerned about the fact that you're not as clued up about child development as you'd like to be. This is a great guidance to support the sector and it's going to be quite powerful and transformative for some people, especially some new teams. I think the fact that they've included quite a lot of content could be really useful for people. I also like the fact that they have used the substrands which have disappeared from the development matters that currently only exist amongst the ELGs. They've chosen to use those substrands. I think that's really effective. It's quite nice. I'm disappointed that they've played around so much with them, but hey, that's, that's a personal decision. And I also like the fact that they've deliberately detached the ELGs from the actual guidance itself, because what they're doing here is they're saying, yes, the ELGs, which are part of the EYFSP, are an assessment, but that's not what you need to plan towards. It doesn't need to be at the end of 40 to 60 anymore. We're not working towards that. What we're doing is we're teaching and supporting children. We just happen to be assessing at some point. Great, thank you guys for detaching that. That's brilliant. Unfortunately, I do wish that you'd stuck with the headings of the ELG if you're gonna do that, because I think from a practitioner's point of view, it's a little bit difficult for me to recognise where they got the ELGs fit into the substrands. Maybe over time I'd get used to that, but for the time being I think I need to just know the document really well to know where other links are going to be made. That's just me, I don't know, maybe it's a, a personal thing, perhaps other people feel like that as well. Um, I like the fact that within some of the areas you've been quite concise, um, I wish you'd been a little bit more concise with some of the other areas. I feel like maths is, a, quite frankly, a bit of a mess. I don't like the use of subheadings in the mathematics strand. Um, I don't really understand why you've chosen to do that when actually the other areas you haven't. And I also feel like after maths, it starts to get a little bit wishy-washy where ranges are sort of added together. Um, it's almost that sort of part, it's that part of the development matters that people didn't used to look at as much because it wasn't assessed for the ELGs, but I feel like that's not good we should be saying, actually, those areas are just as important. But again, that's just my perception. I've not heard anyone from the steering group say that, and I don't think they ever would. So yeah, really good document. Those are my positive things to say about Birth to Five Matters. And then some of my critiques. So I've covered a few of these things already briefly in the previous section, because I can't hold myself back. So too meaty, too much to print out. Ah! <laughs> Those are just superficial things. I think that my main sticking points for this are so much content has been copied over from 2012 that actually 
for some people, those things are not necessarily any more great if you've got some inexperienced staff, but I think even some of the points you're making aren't things that need to be there anyway. We know that if some things are not included, like shape, space and measure in Develop Matters, we'll still teach those things. You know, Jan Dubiel, I think his chap's called from, um, I used to work for Early Excellence, he said in a family blog recently that even though we know they're not there, we're still going to teach them because we know that's important content. Things like colours we've already, we always taught, but yet there wasn't anything specific within Development Matters about colours. Around the maths, we always taught things around zero, we always taught above 20. Even though we didn't assess against those things, we always included those things because it's just a part of the natural journey for children when they're learning. So yeah, I'm not really sure about the math section. Um, I also feel like the design over the colours, let me just find the right page, um, is a little bit lacking. It worries me a little bit that people might misinterpret this. And I did when I first saw it. So I'm going to give you an example here. This is a range one, a range two with a unique channel. That's really good. I love the fact that they're different colours. But then you get to the positive relationships and enabling environments. And for some reason, they are the same colour, which makes me think, OK, this is this is all range one here. Yeah. It's not. What it actually is, is this is range one and range two for unique relationship, a uh, unique child, but this is range one and two, and this is range one and two for those uh, those columns. It's almost as if, I, I wish that what they've done is done like sort of, you know, sort of diagonal lines of blue and green for these two. That would have made more sense to me because when I picked it up, I then went looking on the next page for the range two, and it goes straight on to range three, do you see? I wish that that information had been a bit clearer for me to understand. Um, I figured it out um, and I understand why they've chosen to do that because what they want to say is it's not, um, you're not saying a child's working in range one and then it's different guidance for range two. Nope, it's the same you're just building. But the colours, as a human being, when I see colours like that, it makes me think that's the same section. Um, maybe I'm being a bit too nitty gritty. Sorry if I am, but that just that's important to me, especially because it's a working document that I've got to use every day. So positives about the development matters. I love the fact that it matches up with the government's desire to move staff away from doing excessive observations and assessments, which were never useful to everyday practitioners, and back towards the core skills that we've got, which is working with children, basically. They want us back working with children, which is brilliant. That's what we all need to be doing. And lots of us were already doing that. We just were breaking our backs to do, you know, the unnecessary observations and assessments on the side. So I think it's done a really good job at being able to help us achieve that. Having things like broader ranges, birth to three, um, three and four, and then reception age helps us because there's so much more within those ranges to us to be able to move backwards and forwards. Um, and I'll cover the critique about the opposite side of that in a second. I love the observation checkpoints. I love the way they're worded. They're saying things like, um, I'll just find one really quickly. They're saying rather than at 12 months, they say things like at around 12 months or um, at around a year or whatever it is. I think that's really useful to help us to understand that not all children reach these things at the same time. So brilliant. I'm really proud that they've included those things. And I also like the fact that they've not used substrands. They've kept communication language as one big area. Brilliant. Because yes, it is. There's so many skills involved with that. And we don't teach some of those understanding and listening attention skills discreetly. I don't know about you, but when I observe a child, almost every time there's anything around communication language, I'm taking all three areas from the 2012 version because children very rarely speak without listening or understanding something. It, it doesn't really happen. So I'm really happy that they've chosen to sort of merge them all together. I think from a personal point of view, I think that will be a really positive thing moving forwards. Less words, less for me to have to read, less for me to have to do outside of my core job, which is working with the children. And then critiques of this document. If you are a less experienced practitioner who perhaps might need a little bit more guidance, but you're not able to get that from your team in the moment, this probably isn't the best document for you because it does lack some of the things that Birth to Five Matters covers. This kind of expects people who are working with children to be working at a high level, whereas actually we know a lot of people come in lower down, less experienced, or maybe they're still training when they're with us. So it's probably not going to stand alone um, as a document in, that you would use every day, you might have to have something to go alongside it or more training or a critical friend or a peer or a mentor or someone to support you. The The fact that they've got quite broad ranges for me is a positive, but the critique that other people have had of that is actually 
between birth and three, there's an awful lot that a child is covering that it's quite a complex amount of stuff. And actually, it's quite useful in a way to break it up because we know that a baby is very different to a, you know, a two and a half year old. And we've got children who are working across different ages in different areas. So having that sort of in reception, a child should be able to can be a bit difficult for people who are working in reception because you're going to have to dip back quite far into other areas to really understand how to support those children. I hear that criticism. I don't think it's necessarily relevant all the time, but hey, that's how people feel and I get that. And then also this idea of, um, so the format changing and removing enabling environments and positive relationships and merging them into examples of how to support this. I get why they're trying to do that. It makes it easier and, and, and slimmer. However, there's a difference between what an adult does in a moment, say in a zone of proximal development, sustained shared thinking, than what an adult does when they provide, say, a provocation. So there's interactions, but there's also something you're putting in your provision. And those are two different things. And that's why we've got two different columns in the Develop Matters 2012, and presumably why they've done the same in the Birth to Five. But by merging them on the Develop Matters, I don't think it's a good move because people need to see those things as separate still. Um, but perhaps, you know, if they're if they are thinking actually if staff are in provision all the time, maybe we don't need to separate those two things out. I don't know. I suppose it will, the proof in the, what's the phrase? Proof in the pudding will be in the taste. I don't know what the phrase is. Anyway, we'll, we'll be able to pick up on that when people start using it properly from September. We'll realise whether or not that's sufficient or not. I think Julian and his team probably recognise that this document, um, so that the Development Matters 2012, those columns weren't used very often by practitioners. They should be but they weren't. So having one column on here might be more useful. Um, I don't know, we'll see, won't we? Um, but generally, I don't have anything else to criti criticise the development matters on. I think in terms of content, yes, it's a little bit thinner than birth to five. And yes, to some extent, it does try and formalise learning a little bit more in reception, but we have to be pragmatic about the fact that children are moving onto the national curriculum in most cases. And the national curriculum has a particular sort of standard in quite a lot of um, subjects where, which we have to prepare children for. So we're not trying to say to children that we need to formalise your education, but we need to be able to get you ready for those things. Whilst at the same time saying to year one, come on guys, you need to be ready for these children coming in. Maybe you disagree, please do comment below, be nice. So how has it been received by the sector? Well, if you try to exclude Twitter, the whole of Twitter, <laughs> Um, and an awful lot of people would, how do I word this nicely? There's a lot of egos floating about, let's just say that. Um, if you try to exclude people who've been involved with these um, documents and try to talk to people who are going to be using them, you will find that actually there's an awful lot of positivity for both documents. In fact, people don't really have a massive issue with either. I have talked to quite a few people who've run the EYFSP pilot last year. And whilst they didn't have the development matters to support them, they said that this document makes sense based on what they've just been through. It would have helped them a lot more than the birth to five matters would have because they actually are with the children all the time doing fewer observations and actually they felt like it would have been cumbersome to have the birth to five matters to reference because that's almost telling them what they've got to teach and when, whereas the, birth, the development matters, they've said it feels like it would support them on their journey. I can't really comment that personally because I'm not being part of the pilot, but I've talked to four different pilot schools and the same thing has come out every single time from those people. And my personal view, crush helmet on. Okay, I try to be as positive as I possibly can be, but I am a pragmatic person at heart. I think we are so lucky in the UK, in England, sorry, to have two guidances which are so good and it's hard to find true faults with either of them. And these are exported around the world. People around the world use our curriculum guidances because they are such high quality. So we are so, so fortunate to be able to have this discussion around two high quality documents and then sucking up over. <laughs> the good, they are very good. But if you're like me and you're getting a little bit tired of your job being taken over with accountability, um, things like observations and assessments and actually what you want to do is spend time teaching the children then development matters might be the one for you i feel that that's going to support me in stripping away lots of the unnecessary things that i'm doing in my job that the government doesn't want me to do anymore but if i was 
starting my teaching journey now, I'd probably prefer Bev to five because it fills a lot of gaps that were left in my training. So you need to know your culture really well. You need to know your staff team. You need to know what the children are like. You need to know what your parents are going to think of you. Choosing one of these is not a one-way path either. You can go back if you don't like the one you've chosen. And you can go down that middle road and you can use both. You can choose one to be your main document that you're going to um, plan from. But use the other one as a supplementary guidance. And I think the easiest way to do that is to use your development matters as the main document you choose. And back it up with a bit to five as being a sort of support document. We've always had those available. We've always used things like Music Matters. We've always had CPD and other documents to support what we do. Development Matters 2012 was never the Bible. It was always part of a range of things that we used. Really good settings in schools created their own curriculum so Development Matters wasn't even needed that, very, that much. You might choose to do that if you want to. Most of us want, most of us need to pick one of these guidances. Thinking on your sorry, thinking on your culture as well. If you've got a school that's really big on accountability, and assessment is the thing that's picking people headaches, the chances are people are going to opt for birth to five because it's the most obvious choice if you're going to go back to that sort of tick list assessment of entering developing secure. You can't really do that with development matters, but you can do that with birth to five, which is a massive shame. And it's my main problem, I think, with that document um, in terms of people's choices. Like, I, Choose that document because it's got lots of really good information. Don't choose that document because it fits assessment. That's not useful for people doing the job every day. And that's my message to leaders. Please consider that before you make your choices. I will not be recommending one particular guidance to people unless I know the team very, very well. Jump us back. <laughs> Guys, I hope that was a useful guide for you. I appreciate the fact that there's probably not as many points in there as I could have made, but I've deliberately chosen a few select ones. There's quite a lot of training available on these guidances from various organisations available online. What I would say is before you book on a training session on these guidances, check to see if they're on this list. So this is the list on the back of the Birth to Five Matters. These are the people who've become very involved in Birth to Five Matters who might not necessarily have an objective opinion. Now, I'm not saying those organisations aren't wonderful because they absolutely are. However, unfortunately, I think sometimes people become too entrenched with what they believe and they are not open to criticism and critiques of what they have developed. So... Do think carefully about where you're accessing your training around this. If I find some independent training on these guidances, I will suggest it to you. The majority of you working within a local authority or a maintained school or even an academy or private chain, you may be invited to your local authority training on this. The chances are they will be quite pragmatic and walk a fine line between the two. They will not recommend one guidance over the other, but that's good practice. Oh, that shouldn't use that phrase, good practice, but it is the right thing to do because... You can't, no one can tell you to use one or the other without knowing um, what your setting is made up of. Please do comment below if you think I missed something really big out. I may have, I've recorded this so many times I forget what I'm even called half the time. Um, comment below, please do try and start a conversation with me. See if you disagree, it's fine, it's great. Pop it in the comments below. I've really tried to walk a fine line between um, critiquing and and praising these guidances because I think they have some good and bad about both and I do not want to come across as being negative about either of them because like I said before we are really lucky to have them. If you've enjoyed this vlog please do give it a like and please pop back for future vlogs in the future. Bye!